The Revolutionary War had an obvious impact on the people in North America. Although it was not yet a state, Ohio played an important role during the war. Ohio's only Revolutionary War fort was created to protect the frontier states from an attack by Fort Detroit and Fort Renault. Fort Detroit was an old British fort in Detroit, Michigan. When the war broke out, the British decided to make another fort to aid it. This fort was called Renault. The Western Front was not only controlled by the British, but also the Indians. Most of the Indians in the area were hostile because they believed the colonists were a threat to them. Many of these Indians helped the British during the war by passing along information and attacking the colonists. The closest American fort to Fort Detroit and Fort Renault was Fort Pitt in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was under the command of Commander McIntosh. McIntosh did not think that he could defend the frontier states from the British if they ever decided to attack from Fort Renault. So McIntosh decided to build Fort Lawrence in the Northwest Territory. McIntosh and 1,200 men moved west from Fort Pitt along the Great Trail. The location that was chosen was 60 miles from Fort Pitt, where the Great River crosses the Tuskegee River. Fort Lawrence um, comes into existence because in 1778 there is a problem here in what is called the West, the Ohio country, in that the British at Fort Detroit are supplying the Indians with uh, food and equipment uh, and encouraging them to attack the American settlements along the frontier, which would be in the western part of Pennsylvania, the western part of New York, and the area we would now call West Virginia, or the western portion of Virginia. And these attacks were being committed by those Indians who were friendly to the British cause. Because of that, in the winter of 1777-1778, the Continental Congress meets to talk about this and on a recommendation from the Board of War within the Congress, they decide to have an expedition attack the British at Fort Detroit, which was actually called Fort Lernol. Fort Detroit was an older fort, it was much bigger, it was difficult to maintain, and so the British had built a smaller fort right near it called Fort Lernol. We're going to attack that. and so. An army is to be gathered of approximately 1,800 men. Now, the problem is getting 1,800 men to uh, move out to Fort Pitt, which is the westernmost location of the Continental Forces. That was the as far west as the Continental Army controlled. It was pretty difficult. Uh, there, there was a lack of troops. There was a lack of supplies. There was a lack of food and clothing and equipment. And so getting that army together will be very, very difficult. Eventually what will happen is they will have uh, part of the 13th Virginia Regiment, uh, which were for the most part in blue coats faced yellow, the facings being the cuffs and the collars and the lapels of the coat, and a contingent of the 8th Pennsylvania Regiment who were being from, transferred from the east to Fort Pitt and some of them would have been, been in blue coats faced red and some of them would have probably been in what we call hunting shirts uh, which would have been a great deal more practical here in the west now in addition to those troops there will be militia and the militia were simply civilians who were ordered into service or chose to go into service in their respective colony or state and they wouldn't have looked necessarily very soldierly. But here in the West, uh, the American Army had to depend upon uh, militia to a large extent for what needed to happen here. They will be collected at Fort Pitt, as we said, which was the largest and furthest west of the American, American fortifications during the time of the American Revolution. Uh, the army will be collected there under the command of a man by the name of Lachlan McIntosh, a man of Scottish ancestry who was actually from Georgia, but because his family were close friends with Henry Lawrence, who was the president of the Continental Congress, and in 1778, the most powerful man in the colonies is the president of the Continental Congress, and that would have been this Henry Lawrence from South Carolina. Because his family was friends, uh, McIntosh's appointment to command the army here in the West is not unusual. 
And so the army is gathered at Fort Pitt, and from Fort Pitt, of course, they will then move west along what is called the Great Trail and built uh, this fort here at the Great Crossing, where the Great uh, Trail crosses the Tuscarawas River and uh, becomes known as Fort Lawrence. There were many problems during the building of Fort Lawrence because of the horrible weather conditions. Usually forts were built in May and June, but these men had to build their fort in November. Most 18th century armies only fought during the spring, summer, and fall. The winter was too cold and most weapons did not work in this type of weather, so they did not fight during this time of year. Building the fort was no easy task, even with 1,200 men. They had no horses or mules to help them, so it was pretty much all back-breaking work. Now let's hear more what Tom Heaper can tell us about how the soldiers built Fort Lawrence. The, the army that came then here to the uh, area at the Great Crossing, where the Great Trail crosses the Tuscarawas River, is not the army of 1,800 men that was supposed to come, but more an army of about 1,200 men. And although they were prepared for what they needed to do, Unfortunately, the army should have started in May or June, not in November. Because of that, when the army gets here, it was winter and it had snowed, it had rained, it had sleeted. From time to time, it was freezing. And all of this was not the normal conditions that an army would be in the field. When winter came, normally in the 18th century, armies went in to winter encampment and they stayed out of the field simply because weapons didn't work well in damp weather. The fort will be constructed out of wood. Now these are huge pieces of wood and it took several men to carry these and as they cleared wood back from the area where the fort is built it went further and further inland and so eventually men are going to be carrying huge pieces of wood over rather long distances. They did not have horses, they did not have uh, mules, they did not have oxen to pull these pieces of wood from where the trees had been cut down onto the site. So that's going to be exhausting work. Plus it's cold, plus it's damp, it's not the best of working conditions. While the fort is being built, there is activity in the way that the enemy is watching what's going on, but there were no attacks on the army. Simply because there were so many men here, it would have been unwise for the enemy to attack that large of a body of men. Now eventually, the fort will be complete enough to the point that McIntosh, the commander, General Lachlan McIntosh, will order a garrison of 150 men to remain at Fort Lawrence and the rest of the army to march back to Fort Pitt. Fort Lawrence was now under the command of Commander John Gibson. Gibson and his men first had to finish making the fort, but found it difficult due to the lack of supplies. They were running out of equipment, clothing, and food. Gibson decided to send a letter to Fort Pitt asking for more supplies. Fort Pitt got the letter and sent a party of men to deliver the supplies to the desperate men at Fort Lawrence in January of 1778. As they traveled the 60 miles, the men were attacked by Indians and Loyalists. Two men were killed, four were wounded, and one man was taken prisoner. The Indians took the letters from Gibson and McIntosh and gave them to the British at Fort Renal. The British read the letters and decided that this was a good time to attack the fort. 180 Indians and 10 British soldiers were sent to surprise attack the unexpecting soldiers at Fort Lawrence during the month of February. The soldiers at Fort Lawrence had no idea what awaited outside the fort walls, and when eight men went to gather food, they were instantly attacked and killed. When the soldiers inside the fort realized what was going on, they shut themselves in the fort. However, the Indians remained outside to make sure nothing came in and nothing came out. This is called a siege. Now let's hear what Tom Peeper can tell us how the soldiers coped with such hard living conditions. As we had said, armies normally in the winter months were inside. They were not out in the field. 
Well, the men here at Fort Lawrence are going to try to spend, I'm sure, as much time as possible inside the fort. But there were things that had to be done. They had to finish building the fort. The windows, the doors, the roofs that had not been finished are going to have to be finished after McIntosh and most of the army head back to Fort Pitt. And so there will be work details. McIntosh's army had not been gone long before letters are written by the commander here at Fort Lawrence, a man by the name of Colonel John Gibson, back to McIntosh at Fort Pitt saying, we're short of clothing, we're short of supplies, we're short of equipment, we're short of food. Now, McIntosh had only been gone probably a matter of a few weeks, and already they're short of equipment, which tells us that when McIntosh left, he knew that this fort was not equipped as well as it should be, but he could only do so much. He only had so much in the line of supplies, food, and equipment for his army. In January of 1778, an attack happens as a party of men bring supplies to Fort Lawrence, turn around, and head back to Fort Pitt. In a short distance from Fort Lawrence, they are attacked by a small group of Indians and loyalists, that is, colonists who were against independence. Uh, in this attack, two men are killed, four are wounded, and one is taken as a prisoner. The one man who is taken as a prisoner was carrying letters. And in those letters from Gibson back to McIntosh at Fort Pitt, he said how bad things were here at Fort Lawrence. The British immediately get those letters. They're taken from here up to Fort Lernol. The British commander up there reads them, and he knows that this is a perfect time to attack. A body of about 180 Indians and about 10 men from Eighth a regiment of foot will leave Fort Lernol and come this direction to attack Fort Lawrence. They arrive here in February. They hide in the area. The men in the fort do not know that they're here. And on uh, a day in early February, a group of 18 men are sent out to gather firewood. As they leave the fort, they enter the grassed plains nearby and a short distance from the fort. Indians spring up out of the grass and proceed to bludgeon most of the party to death. The men in the fort were not able to do anything to protect them. Uh, they were beyond musket or rifle shot, and so the, the party was on its own. And uh, as I said, they were either killed or, in one case, two men were captured and drug off. Now, the men in the fort saw this happen and immediately went into a state of siege, if you will. They have what they have. The gates are closed. They're not going to go out if they don't have to. But eventually, supplies are going to become worse. This siege is going to go on for a number of weeks. While the siege is still going on, one man is going to sneak out of the fort, kill a deer, drag it back to the fort, and before anybody could even begin to cut it up, and cook it, the men will literally strip the raw flesh off the deer and eat the flesh raw. Hides were stripped. The men had brought some cattle with them. They had been slaughtered here. That meat had already been consumed. They now turn to these hides, which are laying around, maybe had been used to cover windows or cover doors, and they try to use those as a source of food, trying to scrape any remaining flesh off of the inside of the hide. Uh, that's pretty desperate. Some of the men supposedly even tried to eat their own moccasins. Con assuming that they're made of leather, which they were, they tried to wash them and then cook them and eat them. And obviously any piece of leather that you've been walking in as a shoe or a moccasin for any amount of time is certainly not going to be edible in any sense of the word. Now one of the great legends about Fort Lawrence, and it, it it is a legend, was that the Indians demanded that the fort surrender, and Colonel John Gibson in command of the fort said, we have no need to surrender, we have plenty of food, and gave the Indians a barrel of meat and a barrel of flour to show that they had more than enough food here at the fort. We think that story is apocryphal, legendary. Uh, it sounds good, it sounds interesting, but the likelihood of it happening is, is pretty slim. The fact of the matter is we think that the Indians simply got tired of the siege. It had gone on for 
uh, approximately six weeks. We think they simply got tired of it and decided to go home. And when the Indians left, the British soldiers and the loyalists who were with the Indians left also. And the siege of Fort Lawrence comes to an end in uh, early March. Now, the men in the fort don't know this. They think that the Indians are still out there. Uh, the Indians didn't make a point of showing themselves on a regular basis. And so the men in the fort will continue to assume that the enemy was out there long after the enemy actually left Fort Lawrence. Ultimately, someone slips out of the fort, gets to Fort Pitt, gives word to General McIntosh that the fort is being attacked, and McIntosh gathers up as many men as he can, as much in the line of supplies as he can, and marches out to the relief of Fort Lawrence, about 500 men. And when he gets here, the food that they have brought is being carried on pack horses. Unfortunately, the pack horses are new to military service. Uh, they hadn't been trained to behave in a military fashion. And as the men in the fort see these horses and these soldiers coming, they rush outside and fire their guns in the air, which is called a feu de joie. French for fire of joy. They're so excited by the fact that supplies and uh, relief is coming. The pack animals hear the guns go off untrained and they take off. And a lot of food and a lot of supplies are lost in the woods because the horses just went running and the supply packs bounced around and, and came apart. Enough was gathered up that McIntosh will allow the 150 men here at Fort Lawrence to go back to Fort Pitt and places a new garrison here of approximately uh, 75 men uh, under the command of uh, a new officer and the army now returns back to Fort Pitt and with that the siege has ended and the winter, the rest of the winter is going to pass pretty quietly. During the summer of 1779 the American commander here in the West, Lachlan McIntosh, is going to resign his command. He resigns because he is being attacked politically by other officers in the Continental Army who are saying that he is not doing what he should be doing. He's incompetent. He's a bad officer. One of the worst to criticize him was a man by the name of Daniel Broadhead. And when McIntosh resigns, Broadhead will be appointed to replace McIntosh. Daniel Broadhead believed that unlike McIntosh, he felt the British threat here in the West was not really from Fort Detroit or Fort Lernol, that was actually from the area up by Niagara Falls, Fort Niagara, where the Niagara River enters into Lake Ontario. And so Broadhead felt that Fort Lawrence was totally uh, useless out here in the Ohio country. Matter of fact, one of the nicknames for it was Fort Nonsense. Uh, because it was nonsense to have a fort out here in the middle of the wilderness that didn't really do anything. So when Broadhead takes command here in the West, he immediately announces that he's going to attack the British at Fort Niagara. And to that end, he decides he is going to abandon Fort Lawrence. And in July, he sends word to the, Ameri the commander here at Fort Lawrence, a man by the name of Campbell, that the fort will be abandoned and the garrison and all equipment will be brought back to Fort Pitt. In late July, another message is sent that the uh, garrison is to be prepared to march out uh, at a moment's notice. And then in early August, the word comes the fort is to be abandoned, leave Fort Lawrence. And so Campbell and his uh, garrison, about 50 men, march out of Fort Lawrence. Now, they're to leave the works standing. There is no order that the works are be, to be destroyed. However, some of the men, I suppose, in frustration, possibly, uh, out of irritation, decide to try to set a fire uh, to the fort. We know that that doesn't succeed because in the 1790s, uh, a young man uh, who had been taken captive by the Indians and taken up to the area around Sandusky, escapes from the Indians, gets this far and spends his night here at Fort Lawrence, and he writes many years later in a diary that he spent the night at Fort Lawrence, which was still standing and in good condition. 
So we know that this attempt to destroy Fort Lawrence when the army marched out uh, did not succeed. Uh, the fort will be left standing and we know that it was here as farmers moved into the area in the early 1800s and will only disappear as the farmers decide they have found a source for wood to build barns and corn cribs and pig styes and cattle pens and so on. They simply disassemble Fort Lawrence and the wood is reused for civilian buildings in the area. Today, Fort Lawrence is owned by the Ohio Historical Society. Although the fort is no longer standing, a museum stands in its place to showcase the life of the soldiers at the fort. Also, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier is a part of the museum, and it immortalizes all the soldiers who lost their lives at Fort Lawrence. Archaeologists have played a key role in our current understanding of the fort and what took place there from 1777 to 1778. A local organization, the Friends of Fort Lawrence, also helped to preserve the memory of the men that were stationed here, defending not only the Western theater of the Revolutionary War, but their freedoms, liberties, and independence as well.